Our inheritance, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. What a glorious passage this is as we think of all that we have because of Jesus. An inheritance kept in heaven for you, Peter says in verse 4. I'd like to introduce the message with my mother's parents, Grandma and Grandpa Heron. Grandpa didn't usually look like that with a, you know, a dress coat and slacks. Uh, Grandpa Heron always, in my memory, wore bib overalls, and he wore long johns, uh, the kind that you know were one piece from top down to the ankles. He said they kept him cool in the summer over in Yakima, 100 degree heat, <laughs> kept him cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Grandpa Heron lost everything in the Great Depression, lost some land, uh, his ability to farm the land. And so Grandpa had to work at farm jobs and he would move from season to season uh, to a farm that had a little shack for his family to live in. Grandma and Grandpa at the end of their lives lived in a tiny home with two small bedrooms. Uh, the master bedroom, if you could call it that, was just off the little living room and separated by just a, a curtain. They didn't have much as far as earthly possessions. But their lives, the inheritance that they left their children and grandchildren was an inheritance of love given. Love really described my grandma and grandpa Heron. Uh, they would come to our baseball games when I was a kid. I sort of, at that age, hated to see them come. Uh, Grandpa was about six, three or four, and Grandma was about five feet. And he would have his bib overalls on, and they'd be carrying their lawn chairs out to the baseball game. You could see them coming for a long ways, and I'd sort of cringe. But they were there because they loved their grandkids, they wanted to spend time with us. They always wanted the family, the extended family, to get together for picnics. Uh, and in those days, the extended family lived pretty much in the same community. And so it was possible for aunts and uncles and cousins to be together. And that was a joyous time for Grandma and Grandpa Heron. After Grandma died, she preceded Grandpa in death by about six years. Uh, after Grandma died, Grandpa moved to a nursing home. And when the family, when Grandma and Grandpa were out of their small home, uh, the family children went in to clean the home and so on, and they discovered Grandma and Grandpa's will. And it was just on a piece of paper that they put in the freezer, the upright freezer. So it was just amazing that anybody discovered it without throwing it away. They didn't have much to leave their family except for the memories of their love for each of us. You know, dear friends, the world's inheritances are much like the little bit that grandma and grandpa were able to leave their children. The world's inheritance, inheritances are at best temporary and often very insecure. But in this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter praises the Lord. He blesses the Lord for the eternal inheritance that God is leaving for us who know him personally. It's an inheritance that we are assured of receiving. So I hope you'll turn with me to the passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Where in the New American Standard translation, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation 
ready to be revealed in the last time. Our eternal inheritance, dear friends, should inspire us to bless the Lord, to praise him from day to day. Notice that believers have a living hope. Again, notice verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope. And therefore, the one who's given us that living hope is worthy of our praise. He is worthy to be blessed with every breath we take, actually. He's worthy of our praise. Peter has been contemplating the grace of God. In verses one and two, he is thankful that God the Father, that God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have given us an eternal salvation. It's their work in our lives, and it's an eternal work. Remember in verses one and two, Peter says that the Father has chosen us, chosen us before the foundation of the world because of his great love for us. Peter is reminded that the Spirit of God has set us apart for a purpose, and that is to obey Jesus Christ. He empowers us to be obedient children. And then Peter remembers God the Son, the Lord Jesus, who has paid the price for our salvation. We are sprinkled with his blood. So Peter wants to praise God. He wants the readers of his letter to praise God the Father for his great mercy. And he begins verse three with these words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word blessed is a word that literally means to speak well of him. When you bless God, you're speaking well of him. That's the literal meaning of the word blessed. What is required of me to speak well of the Lord? Uh, there are some practical things that we need to do from day to day in order to speak well of him. One of those things is getting to know him in the word of God. If we're going to speak well of the Lord, we need to know him. We need to know his character. We need to spend time thinking about his character revealed to us in scripture. Speaking well of the Lord also requires that I have a daily walk with him that is meaningful, that I speak with him during my journey through each day, that I fellowship with him. How can I speak well of him if I do not have a friendship, an intimate relationship with the Lord? We need to develop that daily walk with him. And then in order to speak well of him, it requires an openness in talking about the Lord. Uh, he shouldn't be the last topic on our lips. We need to speak of him with our families, blessing the Lord as we go through our days. We need to be free to speak of him uh, even in a public setting or at work or at the grocery store, wherever it might be. We need to gain an openness in talking about the Lord and all of his blessings in our life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much that Peter reveals in, this, in these words, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Peter is a Jewish Christian, and he's thinking of the God of Israel as he reveals the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the God of Israel. And as he mentions the name Father, he's really thinking of a human relationship that the Father has with the Son. He is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see so much in this 
name of Jesus and his titles. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He has supernatural authority. He is God the Son, creator of all things. And his name Jesus, what does that name mean? Do you remember the name Jesus? Help me out. It means Yahweh or Jehovah saves. What a beautiful name. He came to save his people from their sins. And what about Christ? What is the meaning of the, the title Christ? Messiah. He is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. So there's so much said of who Jesus is in these titles, Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses, the Apostle Paul uses this same greeting that Peter uses in a couple of places in his letters. One is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he clarifies who this is. He is the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Some great reasons to bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul uses this same greeting again in Ephesians 1, verse 3, when he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Great reasons to speak well of him. Peter reminds us that we have been shown great mercy from the Lord. This is a wonderful reason for us to bless his name, his great mercy. Uh, the word great that Peter uses in this verse is a word that speaks of a, a measure. And Peter's saying something like this, uh, his mercy is a 10 out of 10. It's as high as you can go on the scale of mercy. His mercy is great. And the word mercy is a wonderful word as well. The word mercy means to show kindness or concern for someone who's in desperate need. And certainly, because we are fallen creatures, we are sinful people, we have a desperate need, uh, and God has shown 10 out of 10 greatness in the area of mercy because of our great need. Notice what Paul says about our great need in Ephesians chapter 2. If you turn back to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, we see the desperate need that we have for God's mercy. Ephesians 2, 1 and following, Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's a desperate condition, isn't it? A dead person is unable to respond to any stimuli. We were desperately in need of his mercy. Continuing in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved." and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Peter says here in verse 3 that God's great mercy caused us to be born again. His great mercy caused us to be born again. It is God's work that has caused you, if you're a Christian, uh, to be born 
again. The word that Peter uses in this verse is a word that means to be caused, caused to be changed as a, as a form of spiritual rebirth. It's to have your mind or your heart changed so that your life will become new and conformed to the will of God. You remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are new creations. We are new creatures in Christ. If you know Jesus as your Savior, your life needs to reveal or to reflect a newness of life in Christ. Peter is going to talk about that very specifically in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 1, if you want to just flip over a few pages, chapter 1 of 2 Peter, beginning in verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence... And notice what this should look like in your life and mine. Applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. The Lord has caused us to be born again, to become new creatures in Christ, and what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 should be evident in our lives as we seek to be growing in these important areas of Christian life. Peter reminds us that all of those who have been born again have a living hope. That phrase is so awesome. A living hope is what we have in Christ the word living means to enjoy life that is real, life that is active and blessed and ultimately endless in the kingdom of God. We're born again to a living, never-ending, full life of hope. And the word hope is an important word here, a living hope. Hope is a word that means to look forward to something in confident expectation. Hope, when it's used in the New Testament, is not like the English word hope, where we wish something's going to happen. That's not what he's saying here. We have a hope that is sure, it's certain. We just don't know the exact timing of when this hope will be realized. It is a sure and certain living hope that we have. Uh, notice back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. 1 Peter 1, 21, where he says, Who through him, that is Jesus, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Dear friends, our hope is living our hope is as certain as the fact that Christ is alive, as certain as he has been resurrected from the grave, our hope uh, is sure. It is a living hope. And please be reminded, dear friends, that the believer's hope is really in sharp contrast to the hope that is offered by the world system. 
the living hope that we have through Christ Jesus is far different. It's in stark contrast to any hope that people have in this world system. The world is passing away, but the hope we have in Christ is a living hope. The world's hope is deceptive. It is ultimately empty, and it is a false hope that is offered. Our living hope is based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember, Peter had witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Remember, he went along with John. They ran to the tomb, in fact. John looked in first, and then Peter looked in and was amazed that the clothes that Jesus had been buried in were lying there, uh, but Jesus' body was gone. He had been raised from the dead. So this is real. <laughs> this is something Peter himself has experienced and knows for himself that this hope is a living hope. He also saw the Lord Jesus in his resurrection. And remember, Jesus encourages Peter to tend or, or shepherd or feed the flock of God. Uh, he gives him that challenge three times, uh, offsetting, I believe, Peter's three-time denial of knowing Jesus before the crucifixion. So, dear friends, we are to speak well of our Father in heaven. We're to bless his name. He has shown us great mercy. He's caused us to be born again. He's giving a, given us a living hope that will never end. Our eternal inheritance should inspire us to praise him. From verse 4, notice that believers have an eternal inheritance. Let me read verse 4 again in our passage. Chapter 1, verse 4 of 1 Peter. Peter says, To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I hope you can get excited about verse 4 of this passage. Our inheritance in Jesus Christ is a safe inheritance and because of that, his praise should be on our lips. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of us speaking well of him uh, from day to day. In his mercy, he's given us an eternal inheritance. The word inheritance is a word that's used in the Old Testament. In fact, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint where this word for inheritance is used to refer to Israel's promised possession of the land. Remember the account in Joshua where the land is given to God's people. The same word inheritance is used of the possession of the land that Peter uses here. Peter describes our inheritance by using three words in verse 4 that describe our inheritance as believers. Notice he says our inheritance is imperishable. Think about that for a moment, imperishable. What does it mean? It means that our inheritance is not subject to death or decay. Our inheritance will never decay. It will never uh, be absent from us. It's an immortal, it's a lasting forever kind of inheritance. Paul uses the same word imperishable in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Our inheritance will never decay it will never die. Our inheritance is also undefiled, Peter says. That means that it is pure, it's untainted, it's without any moral fault, any ritual fault. This inheritance is unstained by the world system. It's unstained by sin, 
There will be no sin when we inherit our heavenly home. Our inheritance will not fade away, Peter says. It will not lose its character. It will not dim in the brightness of what we are given in Christ. It will not decay or spoil or lose its wonderfulness. Our eternal inheritance is so much greater than what the world has to offer. The Apostle John talks about the temporary nature of the world and its pleasures in 1 John chapter 2. Notice back in verse 4 that our inheritance is reserved in heaven for you. If you know Jesus personally, if you've invited him to be your savior, I pray that you have. If you've done that, your reservation for heaven is already in place. Your names are there on the ledger. Your reservation is in. The word reserved in the Greek text is a word that means that God is keeping watch on your reservation. It's kept watch on by God. Peter uses a tense, and I know this is not that meaningful to you perhaps in, in his original writing. He uses a tense that indicates an action that was completed in the past at some point. When your reservation was made, that was the day you invited Jesus to be your savior, to take away your sin. Your reservation at that moment was made. Uh, but the tense that Peter uses here goes on from that moment in the past, whenever it was for you. Uh, it has continuing effect to the present. The reservation was made some years ago, perhaps, but it's good today, and it will be good until you stand in the presence of the Lord. It's reserved in heaven for you. So in contrast to our earthly inheritances, our heavenly inheritance is a done deal. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. If you know Jesus personally, your reservation is in. And it should inspire us to praise the Lord. Let me share a final point from verse 5. That is that we have the assurance of future glory. 1 Peter 1.5, Peter says, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's a pretty safe place, isn't it? That reservation is protected. The word that Peter chooses is a word that speaks of a military garrison uh, in a city protecting the city. Our reservation is being protected by God, by uh, uh, this military term is used, a garrison within the city. Paul uses this very same word protected in Philippians 4, 7, when he says, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We're guarded by the power of God. Power is the word dunamis in the Greek text. Uh, we get an English word from dunamis. The word dynamite comes from this word. Uh, what a, a vivid image of the power of God, the dynamite power of God. He is our creator, we read in Colossians 1. Uh, nothing can separate us from God's love, Paul says in Romans chapter 8. And this reservation is through faith, not by our works, Paul says in Ephesians 2. Notice our reservation will be revealed one day in heaven. He says, for a salvation ready to be revealed... Peter's looking ahead to when our salvation will be complete. And remember, there are three tenses to our salvation. 
you see the screen, notice that at some point in the past, when you asked Jesus to be your savior, the past tense of salvation happened. You were saved from the penalty of your sin. Uh, you were no longer condemned. You had a place reserved in heaven because of your faith in Jesus. That's the past tense. The present tense of salvation is a big word, sanctification. Uh, and that speaks of our being saved from the power of sin in the present. As we allow the Holy Spirit to control us, uh, we can be set apart to live a life that pleases the Lord. That's the present tense of salvation. Peter's talking about that future tense of salvation or glorification when we will be saved from the very presence of sin. There will be no sin in heaven. Our eternal salvation then is protected by the dynamite power of our all-powerful God, by the power of our God who spoke into existence with a word all of creation. These wonderful truths should bring great encouragement to each of us. And we should remember to praise him, to bless his name, to speak well of him. Couple applications as we come to a conclusion. I've been encouraging you to read through 1 Peter. Uh, did anyone read through 1 Peter last week and underscore, I see some hands, uh, some of the commands that are in 1 Peter? Do I just see a couple hands in all of the group here? Okay, I really mean it this time. I really mean it this time. Read through 1 Peter, but maybe with a little different perspective as you read through could you look for truths that you can glean concerning the character of God, the character of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Glean some truths from 1 Peter that will help you to speak well of him. As you get to know who he is, then we need to speak well of him. And then a second application is to pray for an opportunity. Pray for an opportunity to speak well of the Lord in your daily, in your daily week, a day from, what am I trying to say here, day to day uh, week. Uh, really be seriously praying for opportunities to speak well of the Lord, perhaps with someone in your family Maybe it's a neighbor that you have an opportunity to speak to, someone at work, uh, someone at the grocery store. Uh, if you're really praying seriously for those opportunities, I believe God will honor that. Let me conclude my message with the royal inheritance, which is in contrast to the inheritance my grandparents left. When Princess Di passed away in 1997. She left a sizable inheritance for her two sons, William and Harry, in the amount of $20.4 million. With investments and interest, that amount grew during William and Harry's teens and 20s to $31.4 million. But the provision was such that William and Harry were only able to inherit this considerable estate after their 30th birthdays. In June of 2012, William turned 30 and inherited his portion of $31.4 million. Harry inherited his portion on his 30th birthday. Do you remember how long ago that was? Three years ago. He just turned uh, 33 on the 14th or 15th of September. So he inherited his portion about three years ago. The estate is theirs. It has been promised to them, it is in their names, and it has been aside, set aside for them. In the same way as followers of Christ, we have an inheritance. It's based on Jesus' promise. It is our inheritance. It's in our name. 
It's set aside for you and for me. At the right time, probably not at the age of 30, you too will receive your inheritance in full. My grandpa and grandma didn't leave much in the way of an inheritance uh, other than the beauty of their lives, the inheritance of a caring lifestyle that we can imitate, those of us who knew them. Princess Di left a large sum of money to her two sons, but you know they will not be able to take it with them at the end of this life. We should praise our loving Lord who's promised an inheritance that will never perish, that is untouched by the sins of this world, that will never lose its beauty. Dear friends, our eternal inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, should inspire us to praise him from day to day.